Welcome to chapter 27, uh, chest trauma and pleural drainage. And anytime you see pleural drainage, we're going to be talking about chest tubes. Uh, any kind of thoracic injury, it can range from a simple rib fracture or it could be something that's life threatening, like there's been some sort of rupture of organs. They actually break the mechanism of injuries that cause chest trauma into two categories. The first category is called blunt trauma, and that means that the chest has been str uh, struck with some sort of object. And the impact causes a shearing and compression of everything inside the thoracic cavity. Uh, the external injury there may look minor, but internally the organs can have severe injuries. Uh, you can have rib and sternal fractures can actually go in and lacerate the lung tissue. If there's a high velocity impact, like in a car crash, <coughs> excuse me, shearing forces actually uh, can rupture the aorta. The term penetrating injuries uh, is an injury where there's a foreign object that impales or goes through the body tissue. That's an open wound. Uh, an, uh, an example would be a knife wound, gunshot wound, an injury with a sharp uh, object they can be very severe or they can be not that severe depends on what exactly uh, caused the injury the term pneumothorax is when air enters your pleural cavity if you recall or maybe you don't recall normally there's a negative pressure between your uh, visceral pleura and the parietal pleura and they actually call it the pleural space this space contains a few milliliters of a fluid called a lubricating fluid, and it's what reduces the friction when you move around or when you breathe. If air enters this space, there's a change to the positive pressure and the lung will collapse. As the volume of air in the pleural space increases, there's just no ability for the lung to have any volume. You should suspect a pneumothorax after any trauma to the chest wall, but I will say I have had people just have a spontaneous pneumothorax that there was no cause or any any way reason we could figure out why that they had the pneumothorax. It does happen in extremely tall people and I don't know why. As you can see by the picture here, you can actually have an open pneumothorax and that's when air enters an opening in the chest wall and the it comes up through the parietal outer lining of the of the pleura but there is also a thing called a closed pneumothorax and that occurs when the inner lining of the pleura is disrupted and air comes in from the lung there would be no external wound in this situation there's a very nice picture here that shows the air surrounding the collapsed lung you can kind of get a picture of why we're going to have to put the chest tube in there Clinical manifestations with the pneumothorax can be variable. If it's a small uh, pneumothorax, you might have mild tachycardia, dyspnea, and that may be all that you see. But if the pneumothorax occupies a large area, uh, you're going to see respiratory distress, shallow, <clears throat> rapid respirations, dyspnea, and air hunger, and of course, oxygen desaturation. Um, if you go and auscultate, there's going to be no breath sounds over the affected area, and you're going to see on the chest x-ray air or fluid in the pleural space and a reduction in lung volume. A spontaneous pneumothorax will occur due to the rupture of small blebs. Those are air-filled sacs that are on the surface of the lung. A lot of healthy young individuals um, can have blebs as a result of lung disease like asthma, cystic fibrosis, COPD. People who smoke, of course, increase the risk for bleb formation. Uh, other risk factors are being very tall and thin, as I spoke of just a minute ago, anybody who's male, and previous history of spontaneous pneumothorax. Iatrogenic pneumothorax would be due to a laceration or puncture of the lung during a medical procedure. Uh, for example, uh, a subclavian catheter insertion, a pleural biopsy, a bronchial lung biopsy all have the potential to rupture your lung. Um, barotrauma from an excessive ventilatory pressure during mechanical ventilation. You have to think about that. Any type of esoph esophagus procedures. Um, tearing during insertion of a gastric tube could allow air enter to enter from the esophagus and cause this kind of a problem. You have to think big here. Think about all the things the way that this could happen. Again, they're narrowing down here the types of pneumothorax for you.
on this PowerPoint, they've got the word here open when air enters through an opening in the tuss wall or closed pneumothorax when there is no external wound visible. An open or a closed pneumothorax can become a tension pneumothorax. A tension pneumothorax occurs when air has entered the pleural space and it has nowhere to escape. The continued accumulation of the air in that pleural space is going to cause compression of the lung on the affected side and pressure on the heart and your vessels. It's going to push them away from the affected side. The mediastinal shifts toward the unaffected side and starts to compress the good lung and is that further compromised oxygenation. Pressure increases, the venous return decreases, and the cardiac output starts to fall. A tension pneumothorax can result from an open or closed pneumothorax. If it's an open chest room, the flap from the opening may act as a one-way valve. That means that the air is going in, uh, the air comes in during inspiration, but it can't escape. A tension pneumothorax can also occur with mechanical ventilation and when they're doing resuscitative efforts. It can occur if a chest tube is clamped or becomes blocked in a patient with the pneumothorax. Unclamping the tube or relief of the obstruction may correct the situation. And that's a very important point because I see oftentimes in class questions asking you, well, you don't see the chest tube. It doesn't appear to be working. What do you do first? Well, I look and make sure that the patient isn't laying on the tube. I kind of relay it across. It kind of lays across the bed like a Foley tube does. You have to make sure there's no kinks and you hang the little unit. It doesn't sit on the floor. It doesn't hang on the railing. It hangs on the bed like the Foley catheter does. Attention pneumothorax is a medical emergency, as you can imagine from what we've talked about. Both the respiratory and the cardiovascular system are affected. Manifestations include dyspnea, uh, tracheal deviation, decreased or absent breath sounds on the affected side, neck vein distension, cyanosis, and profuse diaphoresis. If the tension in the pleural space is not relieved, this patient is going to, going to die because he's going to have inadequate cardiac output and severe hypoxemia. They usually treat this with medical decompression and a chest tube insertion. We're going to discuss this here in a couple of slides, what you need to do for the chest tube insertion. A hemothorax is an accumulation of blood in your pleural space that results from injury to the chest wall or diaphragm. If a patient has a traumatic hemothorax, he requires immediate insertion of a chest tube to evacuate the blood in the space. Uh, if, this, if a hemothorax occurs also with the pneumothorax, it's called a hemoneumothorax. You can also have a chylothorax, which is the presence of lymphatic fluid in the pleural space. Very, very common with people with cancer. I have heard of it happening, happening in small infants that are born prematurely. Uh, some cases of chylothorax can heal with conservative treatment and some do need surgery. Uh, treatment of a pneumothorax depends on the severity and the nature, the nature of the cause. <clears throat> if the patient is stable and has a minimal air or fluid accumulated in his interpleural space, he may not need treatment, the condition may resolve on its own. But the most definitive and common form of treatment of a pneumothorax or a hemothorax is to put a chest tube in and connect it to something called water seal drainage. That's a chest tube. That's another, doctors are right, uh, get chest tube to water seal. And I'm going to explain that here in a little bit. If you have repeated spontaneous pneumothorax, they may need to treat that surgically. I have heard of people getting partial pleurectomies. There is a procedure listed on your PowerPoint here called pleurodesis, and that's where uh, they use medicine to adhere the lung to the chest wall so it stops collapsing. Uh, and you see the term on here, urgent needle decompression. That's a thoracentesis. That's another way of saying thoracentesis, uh, which is where they go in and they needly, uh, they use a needle to pull everything off of the chest area. Sometime as you progress in your nursing career, you're going to hear the term penetrating chest wound or sucking chest wound. Sorry for the word, but that's what people do. When you hear the air coming, you're going to hear air basically coming out of the wound in the person's chest, and it sounds like a large sucking sound. And what's going on is air is entering the pleural space during inspiration. Your emergency treatment in this situation is to cover that wound, 
in the chest with an occlusive dressing that is secured on three sides. They actually call it a vent dressing. Uh, Let's say, well, why would you do that? Why would I put a vent and dressing over this man's chest in an emergency? Uh, What happens basically is you need the dressing to pull against the wound during inspiration so the air doesn't come into the pleural space from outside. And then in expiration, the pressure rises in the pleural space that dressing is pushed out and the air can escape through the wound from underneath the dressing. Okay. If there's any type of object ever in the open chest wound still in place, you are not to ever remove it until there's a healthcare provider present. You can stabilize any type of impaled object uh, with a bulky dressing if you need to, but we don't pull it out. We leave it in. And I was thinking the other day about that uh, gentleman who died, the crocodile hunter. He had something stuck in his chest and he pulled it out and he died. Uh, the holes, no one in there to give him any care there for that. You would you want to keep that in there until you can have it surgically removed. As we discussed earlier, the most definitive and common treatment for a pneumothorax or a hemothorax is a chest tube hooked to water seal drainage. Uh, repeated spontaneous pneumothorax may need some sort of uh, surgical treatment. And attention pneumothorax is always a medical emergency, requires medical uh, urgent needle decompression, and then they follow and then they insert a chest tube. Uh, this is sort of interesting. Rib fractures are the most common type of chest injury that result from a blunt trauma. Uh, ribs five through nine are the most commonly fractured because they're the least protected by your chest muscles. If the fractured rib ends up being splintered or displaced, it can damage your pleura, your lungs, and other internal organs. Uh, manifestations of fractured ribs, pain at the site of injury, especially during inspiration and when a person coughs. You'll see patients kind of splint the affected area and they're taking a shallow breath. They're trying to decrease the pain in that area. Very common to see atelectasis and pneumonia develop because of the de decreased chest wall uh, movement and the retained secretions. The goal of treatment with a rib fracture is to decrease pain so the patient can breathe adequately and clear secretions. Uh, strapping the chest with tape or thoracic binders is no longer recommended. It limits chest expansion and predisposes the individual to atelectasis. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, opioids, and thoracic nerve blocks can also be used to reduce pain and aid with deep breathing and coughing. And you have a lot of patient teaching in this situation. You have to emphasize deep breathing, coughing, your incentive spirometer, and of course, encourage people to get pain medication if they need it. I want you to take a good look at this picture. This picture is a flail chest, F-L-A-I-L. -L. And if you look at the picture, you can see where the ribs are fractured. A flail chest results from fracture of several consecutive ribs in two or more separate places, and they cause an unstable segment. It can be caused by fractures of the sternum and several consecutive ribs, and it caught and the resultant instability when the ribs are broke. Um, it did, and this is in the chest wall area. It causes a problem during breathing. Uh, the affected flailed area will move in the opposite direction with with respect to the intact portion of the chest, and that means that during inspiration. The affected portion is sucked in and during expiration, it kind of bulges out. Uh, that's paradoxical. It's a paradoxical chest movement. It prevents adequate ventilation, but will increase this person's work and their breathing. And the underlying lung may have contusions and contributing to the hypoxemia. A flail chest is usually apparent on visual examination. The patient will have rapid, shallow respirations. They'll have tachycardia. They're moving air poorly. You can see movement of their thorax, thorax is asymmetrical, very uncoordinated. They may be splinting the chest to try to help themselves to breathe. Um, you'll see the observation of the abnormal thoracic cavity movements. You can palpitate for crepitus near the rib fractures. Uh, the chest x-ray will show the uh, I'll assist you in this diagnosis. Uh, your initial therapy will consist of ensuring adequate ventilation and supplemental oxygen. Your goal is to facilitate lung expansion and ensure adequate oxygenation. You will be giving analgesic to help promote adequate respiration. Although many patients can be managed without mechanical ventilation, it may be necessary.
They can also do a surgical fixation of the flailed sex set section if needed. Here's a term I think everyone should, should know or be familiar with, the term cardiac tamponade. Okay, and you see the word tampon in there, pressure, it's actually a French word. And basically what this is, is blood rapidly collects in the pericardial sac, compressing the heart. The pericardium doesn't really stretch. And once you start having this um, a compression in the area, the ventricles can't fill. Uh, you're going to hear muffled distant heart sounds, hypotension, neck vein distension, and increased central venous pressure. And this is a medical emergency. They're going to have to do a periocardiocentesis with some sort of surgical repair. They're going to have to go in there and pull that blood out of there with a needle. Uh, this person's going to die. Their heart has no room to do its lub-dub, lub-dub. The blood is down in there and it's preventing it from doing that. Uh, this slide is talking about and reviewing some signs of respiratory distress. Um, uh, signs of respiratory distress include dyspnea, re uh, cough with or without hemoptysis, cyanosis around the mouth, the face, the nail beds, mucous membranes, tracheal deviation, uh, audible air escaping from a chest wound, decreased breath sounds on the side of the injury, decreased O2 saturation, frothy secretions, frothy, the secretions come up, they have like a foam almost to them. I, I, I hate to use that an example. It looks like a froth on the top of a beer. It's white like that, foamy. Uh, you'll reckon once you see it, you will not forget that you saw it. Uh, this particular uh, PowerPoint slide is talking about signs of cardiovascular compromise. They include rapid, thready pulse, decreased blood pressure, narrowed pulse pressure, asymmetrical blood pressure values in the arm. That means they're very, very different uh, uh, in, in, in the arm. Uh, they're usually normally a little bit different, but they're fairly close. Uh, this is something that would be very obviously uh, something's going on on one side of the body. Uh, distended neck veins, muffled heart sounds, chest pain, and then just dysrhythmias. Your initial interventions for anyone with chest trauma include, number one, if they are unresponsive, you assess what? Circulation, airway, and then breathing. If they're responsive, you monitor the airway, breathing, and circulation, you absolutely have to ensure they have a patent airway. You can go ahead and give them high flow oxygen to keep their SpO2 above 90. You would go ahead and establish IV access and you put in two large bore catheters and begin fluid resuscitation as appropriate. Uh, it isn't unusual to have clothing removed to assess the injury. In the ER, they'll just cut the thing right, they'll cut your shirt right off of you. Uh, and what you normally do is cover that sucking chest wound with a non-porous dressing. And remember, you only tape it on three sides. This slide is giving you additional interventions that need to be completed initially for someone who has chest trauma. Number one, you stabilize any impaled objects. Put a bulky dressing, but don't remove the object. Assess for other significant injuries and treat appropriately. You put the patients in a semi fallous position or position the patient on the injured side if the breathing is easier after they rule out a cervical spine injury. Administer small amounts of analgesia as necessary for pain and will that will help with breathing. Prepare for emergency needle decompression if it's a tension pneumothorax or you suspect cardiac tamponade. And there's ongoing monitoring. Monitor vital signs. Uh, level of consciousness, O2 set, cardiac rhythm, urinary output. You should anticipate that they may have to intubate this patient. You may have to release the dressing if a tension pneumothorax uh, develops. If, if the dressing's too tight um, if, on a sucking chest wound, a tension pneumothorax will occur. Ongoing monitoring includes monitoring vital signs, level of consciousness, O2 set, urinary output, and always, always remember to anticipate intubation. If enough fluid or air accumulates in the pleural space, the negative pressure becomes positive and the lung will collapse. And as a result, a chest tube will be inserted to drain the pleural space and reestablish negative pressure and allow the lung to re-expand. <clears throat> chest tubes can also be inserted in the mediastinal space to drain 
uh, air and fluid postoperatively. Chest tubes are about 20 inches long. Um, they can vary in size from 12 French to 40 French. As you remember, that's how Foley catheters are uh, labeled in, the, in French. The word French follows the number. Uh, the size that they pick for the patient is determined by the patient's condition. Large tubes are usually used to drain blood. Uh, medium French sized tubes are used to drain fluid and small tubes are usually just to drain air. They do make a pigtail tube. It's a 10 French. It has a little curly end and uh, it's safe and effective alternative to the larger uh, test chest tubes that you see. Insertion of a chest tube can take place in the emergency department, the operating room, or it can be done at a patient's bedside. Uh, you position your patient with his arm raised above his head on the affected size, side. You want to expose the mid axillary area. Uh, that's the standard site where they go to insert. You elevate the patient's head of bed 30 to 60 degrees if possible because you want to lower the diaphragm uh, and reduce the risk of injury. If time permits, they'll bring a portable chest x-ray to confirm that that is the affected side. They clean the area with an antiseptic solution. You have to set up a sterile field or assist with that. Uh, the chest wall is, uh, get, they put a little local anesthetic in and they make a small incision over a rib. And they, they actually stick their finger in there. They probe that area digitally because they don't want to uh, have any more injury in the area. They put a clamp to hold the chest tube and guide it into place. They advance it up and over the top of the rib to avoid intercostal nerves and the blood vessels that are in that area. Once they insert the tube, they actually suture it. They close, the, they close up the incision with sutures and they connect it to the pleural drainage system. Uh, the wound is usually covered with an occlusive dressing. Uh, a lot of times they'll have you put a petroleum jelly. Uh, most uh, facilities have in their policy that the initial thing that you lay over the chest tube insertion site is uh, a sterile petroleum jelly. Um, they have to confirm proper chest tube placement with an x-ray before you can hook it uh, uh, anything up to suction. The insertion of the chest tube and its presence in the pleural space is very, very painful. Uh, you have to monitor the patient's comfort at frequent intervals and give pain medicine as needed. Now, you can see here in the two pictures, they show the test tubes inserted into the uh, thoracic cavity. Uh, this uh, PowerPoint slide is talking about a flutter valve. I've also heard it called a Heimlich valve. I've probably heard of the Heimlich maneuver. Uh, Heimlich was a, a doctor. Uh, basically what this flutter valve does, it evacuates air from the pleural space. They put it on the chest tube system um, when they want to transport someone. Basically the device has a one-way rubber valve with a rigid plastic tube on it. They attach it to the external end of the chest tube and during inspiration when pressure in the chest is greater than the atmospheric pressure, the valve will open and during expiration when the intrathoracic pressure is less than the atmospheric pressure, the valve will close. Uh, this flutter valve is used for smaller to moderate sized pneumothorax and it can also be helpful. It allows for mobility of the patient. You can attach a smaller drainage bag hidden under the clothes if you need to get the patient up and get him to ambulate because you run into that issue. We still have to get these people up like we do other patients. You can see here in the picture, the drainage bag is attached to the flutter valve. Um, if you're going to do this, you must have the vent because you're going to get attention normal thorax if you don't. Um, a patient can actually go home with this, with the Heimlich valve in place. So that's kind of why it's come into fashionable use recently. This picture represents the original setup for pleural drainage. They used to use glass bottles. When I first got out of nursing school, that was all you would see was these three glass bottles. And these glass bottles have been replaced by a single plastic unit. Uh, but if we visualize it in this way, it might be easier to understand. The, the plastic unit that you get actually has three chambers that took the place of the three bottles. So what happens is they insert the chest tube and that requires you have to attach that chest tube to a drainage device or a chamber. And that, that chamber is what's going to collect the fluid and the air and the blood. Uh, they do make several different companies um, make disposable drainage units. Um, but common to every one of them is they have these three sections. Okay. Now the first compartment, 
in the chamber is always the collection chamber. And in this picture, the collection chamber for you is on the left side. Okay, it goes, uh, it receives the fluid and air from the plural space. The drain fluid stays in this chamber. And then what happens is expelled air vents over to the second chamber. Okay, now the second compartment is called the water seal chamber. It has about two centimeters of water and that acts as a one-way valve. Incoming air enters from the collection chamber and bubbles up through the water. The water prevents the backflow of that air to the patient. The third compartment is called the suction control chamber. It puts suction, suction to the chest uh, drainage system. It's usually back on the wall or sometimes you can see a portable uh, suction uh, system. There's two main types of suction control that you can use. There's water or dry. The water suction control chamber has a column of water to control the amount of suction that's coming. It's usually filled with about 20 centimeters of water. Um, if the negative pressure generated by the suction exceeds 20 centimeters, air from the atmosphere will enter the chamber through a vent that's on top of the unit and air will uh, bubble up through the water. Okay. And when you look at the test tube box, and if you see bubbling in the water seal chamber, it does indicate an air leak, but it may be that it's expected that they kind of expected that that would happen depending on the amount of the injury. This is a picture of an atrium plural drainage unit. It has water suction control. I put a one up in the area that points to the water seal chamber. There is a heading there where the suction control is regulated and down where I put the number two is where the air leak monitor is. That's where you're gonna look and you're gonna see if there's bubbling to see if there's a leak. And number three is, is where the blood comes from the patient in the air on this unit and it's the collection chamber. Um, these are the three bottles that took the, these took the place of the three bottles. When you first open this up, it comes in a sterile blue wrap. And if it's a water seal, which is the most common, it'll have the water already in it. You open it up and there's like a little direction sheet because the first time I had to set one up in an emergency, I had never, I had learned about chest tubes in nursing school, but had never actually set one up. And it was evening and late. There's not a lot of people to talk to to ask for help, but there's a little instruction sheet when you open it up. Everything's inside and sterile. But uh, you, this is actually separate from the actual chest tube, comes in another different sterile container, and they actually give you a chest tube insertion kit with everything in it. You have to set up, help set up a sterile field in a room, you have to make all the visitors get out. So, And these three chambers kind of threw me for a loop, but once you know where they're at and kind of get a picture of what it looks like, it makes it a little bit easier to understand. As I mentioned, when you go to prepare this drainage unit, there's like a little sterile container kind of hooked to the system and you just have to uh, initiate it and start it and it'll push the water right into the water, into the chest tube uh, suction control unit for you. The big thing to remember, um, uh, keep your tubing loosely coiled below the chest level. Tubing should drop straight from the bed. Uh, or chair to the drainage unit. Don't let it be compressed. A lot of people tape the connections. Uh, we want to keep them tight. Uh, you want to keep that system pa patent. There's a dry suction where they um, they don't add uh, water to the whole system. I don't see those as common, but they do have a little display window there to let you know what your suction level is. The dry suction control uh, systems have no water. You just dial up the negative the pressure that you want. They have to be vented. As I said, they're not as common. This shows the uh, dr uh, dry chest tube uh, suction control, the, the suction control chamber. You can see it is slightly different. Uh, this slide is about nursing management. You always observe to see if titling is present. You always need to check every shift or every time you check the patient. Observe for an air leak and that's the bubbling in the water seal chamber. Um, make sure that the fluid levels are still present in the water seal chamber area. Remember to monitor the patient's clinical status. You need to assess vital signs, lung sounds, pain. Assess for manifestations of some sort of reaccumulation of the air and fluid in the chest. If they start to have decreased or absent breath sounds, some sort of significant bleeding coming out of the chest tube greater than 100 mLs an hour.
a chest strain is, uh, that looks infected or the patient has a fever. Uh, notify a physician because you're going to need some kind of management plan. Uh, encourage the patient to breathe deeply. He needs to facilitate his lung expansion. He needs to do range of motion on the shoulder on the infected size. He needs to do his incentive spirometer every hour to prevent atelectasis. We no longer milk or strip a chest tube. We did it for years. We would go and you would take hold of the chest tube and they thought that there were blood clots in it and they would have you pull like you're kind of like you're on milking a cow. You would pull and the goal was to supposedly not have uh, any clots in there. We no longer do that. It increases the interpleural pressure and damages the lungs, your job, and things that they expect you to know for NCLEX and that all things that all nurses know is you need to position that tubing. You want the drainage to flow freely so we negate the need to milk or strip. Nursing management, make sure and monitor the integrity of the chest tube system. If any of the following occur within the first hour, you have to notify a healthcare provider at once. Any drainage that's greater than 200 ml, subcutaneous emphysema, basically that's air underneath the skin, uh, respiratory distress, and the color and the amount of the drainage. We do not elevate the chest tube unit above the chest. We change that container out when it's full. We don't empty the drainage into a measuring container. It has the measuring units right on the container. You always report anything greater than 100 ml an hour. If the if the little uh, if the port, if the chest tube unit gets overturned, you're going to have the patient exhale and you're going to have him cough while you go and you try to get this everything uh, taken care of. You never clamp the system, and we did it for years. We used to keep hemostats at the bedside, and people would go and clamp it. We found out that that is just not uh, not good nursing practice. If there's any kind of break in the system where suddenly you have the chest tube in your, your left hand and the unit has come displaced from the chest tube, you take the distal end of the chest tube and you put it in sterile water to maintain the water seal until someone's able to assist you and reset up the uh, uh, water, uh, the chest tube unit. Once lungs have re-expanded and drainage is minimal, they will remove the chest tube. They expect you to pre-medicate the patient and during the uh, re uh, removal, they will have the patient do the Valsalva maneuver. They'll have you put on occlusive dressing. They will do a chest x-ray and they will expect you to monitor for respiratory distress and problems throughout the rest of the uh, uh, post chest tube time.